I want to tell you how this program came about. Uh, I've attended a few programs at the National Arts uh, Gallery in New York City. It's not far from where I live. They do lots of programming, most of it free, concerts, talks. I heard Harvey Feierstein speak there. Uh, they have art shows, they have a gallery, and I get emails with their upcoming events. One of them was about Pasanke eggs. And I thought, wow, absolutely, I'm going to do that. That was not a free program. It was a $40 donation to help Ukraine. And I said, oh, I, I'm there. And I went and I had a ball. I heard Paul speak. We actually, it was a workshop, so we actually did our own eggs, and it was great fun. I think he's terrific, and without further ado, I'm going to let him introduce himself. So thank you, Paul. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, that was a fun night um, at the National Arts Club. Um, yeah, and I think we raised a good bit of money, you know, at least over $1,000, you know, for the, I think it went to the International Relief Fund. Um, yeah, so my name is Paul Warhan. Um, I'm I known sometimes by friends as, as the Eggman. I, I lived for a while in Provincetown. So if you go to Provincetown and ask for me, people would know me more as the Eggman than even my given name, oftentimes. Or colloquially, I'm called Eggy. Um, so in any event, um, my work with Eggshell is because I grew up in a Ukrainian family. Um, I had a very close relationship with my mother. And she was very keen on transmitting Ukrainian culture to her children. And I was the one that really was the sponge to absorb it. And so traditionally in a Ukrainian family, one is taught how to do these Easter eggs as we would call them, um, that are called pisanke. What, what you're seeing though, are actually these traditional Ukrainian eggs. And this is from a National Geographic that came to us when I was 11 years old. So realize that I've just started doing this maybe at the age of eight, learning this traditional folk craft. And of course, as a family, you know, we got the National Geographic. So this is, you know, the article that begins, you know, in a sense, this kind of, for me, um, you know, it's the sense of being Ukrainian and being honored by being Ukrainian. It was very, it was a very touching thing for me personally. Because um, one of the things I'm, I, I talked a lot about, about the National Arts Club, um, and I don't want to get too much into, but there's something about the tenacity of Ukrainians to have held on to this tradition, which kind of it parallels the tenacity they're having right now in the response to this war and this aggression. And one of the things I want people to realize is that Ukrainians, you have to think about as being a colonized people who since like you know, the 14th, 15th century were colonized by regional superpowers, first Poland, Lithuania, and then Russia, or the Ottoman Empire from the south. And so these people, that, when that happens, the upper echelons of society go off into the dominant culture. So what's left behind are the peasants. And so the peasants keep their folk stories, their folk songs, their folk culture, and this is a piece of that. And so Ukraine wasn't industrialized till the 1950s, after World War II. And my grandparents came over before World War I. So these people are carrying this lineage with them. And, and it really helps identify people in their sense of identity because they've been colonized by other people. And so this whole line that you even heard Putin talking about, like Ukraine doesn't exist. These people aren't their own culture. I mean, the Ukrainians will like tell you like he's, you know, this is to me typical Russian hegemony that has been going on for centuries. And so Ukraine, this, is, this whole war, unfortunately, is not a new story. That's what I'm just trying to get across. And again, the response that we're seeing to me is similar to the response of people holding on to the sense of themselves through these art forms. And the thing that's interesting about this art form is actually it's a pre-Christian phenomenon. And this is this middle splash page I just want to show you that I then started copying and perfecting my own artwork as a teenager. 
So I used to look and I keep copying these designs. But the thing about this artwork to understand is that all of this design work, and you can kind of see that on the bottom of this slide, you're showing what these different symbols mean, because what you're seeing actually um, is an art form that's really in a way, I mean, just to be using a really modern, it's a form of witchcraft. It's a form of talisman making. And what you were supposed to do traditionally is to use the children of the rooster to make these eggs. So that meant you had a fertile egg. So there's three things you could do with a fertile egg. You can eat it, you can raise it to being you know, a chick, or you can make magic with it. And so the power in the talisman to be created was the power of the new life in the egg. And what you're seeing in this decorative motif is a language of symbols telling the user how that power would be used. You see, so the whole decorative motif is a language. The power is the egg. So this art form is called pisanke, and it's derived from the verb pisate, which means to write. So when you say in Ukrainian, I'm going to make these eggs, you're saying, ya pishu pisanke, which means I am making these eggs, I am writing, and what I am writing by making the design is I am writing my intention for how this power will be used. So that's the cultic original form of what happens. It's at least 3000 years old. It's pre-Christian. There are symbol. And so what I'm going to start showing you is a really interesting ethnographic study that I found of like really ancient designs that have been kept alive, you know, and there's a lot of animal figurines. And so, um, you know, the process herein is using beeswax. This is batiking on a shell. So what you're doing is starting with a white shell and drawing with wax where you see it will be white. You're gonna dye the egg, say yellow, and then wherever it's yellow, there will be wax put there. And then maybe you're dyeing the egg red. These are the very traditional colors, like white, yellow, red, black. And interestingly enough, it kind of mirrors the four directions in Native American spirituality as it's practiced today. That's so there's true. these weird, these interesting correlations that go on with color and with design. There are designs that show up in these eggs that look to me like something kind of come out of Central America in the Neolithic period, you know, or the, you know, the early bronze period. I mean, this is, this is fascinating to me. So what you're seeing here is <clears throat> different um, designs from different regions is what this, this image is showing you. These designs specifically come out of what's called Hutsulschina, which is the Carpathian mountain people called the Hutzels, or some people call them the Gutzels. They're an interesting people because actually there were Romanians that got Slavicized and they speak Ukrainian, though their culture is originally Romanian. Like they have a, Rom they have a, a, a male initiatory dance we call in Ukrainian the Arkan, they call it the Argan. And these, these colors you're seeing from there are matching the landscape. So the colors you're seeing showing up is matching and it's very similar to their embroidery. It's very similar to their woodworking is this design. Now you'll see, for instance, in a lot of these images, see these male stags, these kind of dare images. Those are symbols given to usually the man of the house for prosperity and strength. That's what those are for, like, you know, a, a healthy flock. You know, so th that's what those images give you. Here you're seeing floral images of various forms and these kind of like these are. Um, oh, that's is interesting. These are goose. These number two on the right side are goose feet. That's <laughs> what that means. Um, and, you know, again, some of these are protection symbols. You know, like number 11 on the right side, that rake is about harvesting. Um, so, you know, again, these are all symbols. These are symbols for how a, a particular intention is how this work is, is how this work is done. Um, the thing that you're starting to see on, you know, these, you know, again, swirl patterns, these images in um, Number five and number six on the right side, for instance, is like representing a rooster. 
And then you see next to it, you see the images of like oak leaves. So like oak leaves would be a, a, a symbol for strength. So, you know, I, you know, just giving you some of these symbols that, you know, I know about and I'm, when I'm looking at these. Um, all of the ones on the left that you see this kind of, this kind of star pattern goes back to the fact that these people were sun worshipers originally. The steppe peoples had a sun god and that important sun god was represented in symbols like that. The 40, these triangles on the right are dividing the egg into 40 triangles. Of course, a lot of these symbols become Christianized when Christianity comes in. So they would represent the 40 days of Lent. So, you know, just as, an, as a way of like looking at that symbology of why that egg is divided that way. Um, it's, I want to point out, for instance, because um, I think it'll show up later, number nine and 10 on the left side of this one, this is called the, uh, it's called the Kozatska Sloboda, which means like the, the Cossacks crossroads. It's like their fate. Um, it's an image that I wanted to point out because I've done that image a lot and I've included it in a lot of my collage work. So maybe later, if I, if I remember, if I put in the collage that had that, that image in it, you'll see, you know, where it came, comes from. I'm, I'm just kind of curious if there's any questions at this point along the way. Uh, it's Nancy Paul, uh, Nancy Yoshi. I, I was just wondering, you, you, you read and, and speak Ukrainian, it, it, it seems, is that correct? Yeah, I could read any of this to you. For instance, the top of the page is the Veliki album Ukrainskich Pesanok. But anyway, um, yeah, no, I can, I was, you, part of my life story is I spent um, high school and college years in a Ukrainian Catholic seminary. Oh. So I, I taught, I was taught Ukrainian language. And, you know, there is the sense of like, you know, all meaning is applied and the history you learn is relevant to how you look at the world. And I was really like in that seminary, you know, these are people from Western Ukraine and I was really imbued with what it meant to be Ukrainian. So I did learn the language and I did study some literature. Now, mind you, my language skills right now are pretty rusty and they're pretty just kind of like commonplace. I did go to Ukraine with my mom. I took her on a trip when she turned 80 in 2009 and we did like language immersion with a family that didn't speak any English. These are people who are related to people in her parish back in Connecticut and the, the church she belonged to. So it was really interesting. By the end of that week, I was dreaming in Ukrainian and stayed on longer. But, um, you know, so my Ukrainian was okay then. But again, when you don't use the language, you know. Yeah, you know, get rested. It doesn't, it, it doesn't help. It's just, I'm realizing that because this is the end of what I'm showing you is the traditional realm of the work that I'm showing you, because I'm about to show you, start showing you my work. And so that's why I was wondering if there's any questions around technique, the traditional technique or these design images, et cetera. You know, I'm just curious to answer those before we move on. Could you describe the traditional technique? Sure, okay, um, I had earlier, but um, I'll just, you know, take you, let's just say, for instance, let me just, let's look on this page on the left side at number eight, okay? So you've got a white egg in your hand. And again, this is a wax resist process of, hand, of drawing wax on the shell as a resist to the dyeing process. So for instance, oh, look at number five on the right side, that's even a simpler one. So all of that white line you see was drawn with wax and then the egg was dyed black and then the wax is removed. And so hence you've got that white line against that black space. That's the essential process. If you look at number eight, what would happen is you would draw when the egg was white, the wax lines that you see that are white, and then the egg would be dyed yellow. And then after, you know, then you dry the egg once it's dyed, and then you're waxing in the yellow that you see there. And then the egg is dyed red. And then those, you know, again, the red dots are drawn in with wax, and then the egg is dyed black, and then the wax is removed. No, there is also like there's kind of a ritual side to even, you know, put the egg into an oven and the oven is supposed to represent the sun. You know, this is kind of, again, part of the cultic mythology of doing these eggs um, from a Ukrainian perspective. But that's the essential process. So it's, it's, it's batik, just like batik is done on fabric. But the tool that we're using is similar to what you would call a janting tool. Unfortunately, I don't, 
I didn't bring any, I'm not at my studio either to, to show you this, these tools, but it's, a, it's basically a brass cone mounted on a stick. Sometimes I'm also, and I'll point out where I do it, I'm working with anybody who's a calligrapher here, I'm working with calligraphy pens with a B6 or a C6 nib for a very sharp pointed line that I could then use to draw figures. So I use that tool as well, so. Well, there's a couple of other questions here. Uh, do you, uh, one person asks, do you layer light to dark? Uh, traditionally you do. And part of that is just because you're doing an immersion dye process. And so if you had a darker color trying to go to a lighter color, you would actually mess up the dye itself. You know, um, though I have played with that a lot and there are ways in which I've learned how to clean off the shell back, going back to shell. I mean, you could do it as roughly as just bleaching the shell with and taking the dye off. But often what I prefer doing is just washing the shell off. And then the other thing that I've learned how to use a lot is just vinegar as an acid with working with shells has properties in which I'll show you where I can etch the shell um, using, again, vinegar as my acid. But then what I'm also doing is using vinegar to clean the shell because because again, vinegar as the acid will eat at the calcium, I can remove the outer layer of the shell um, to get back to white, you know. Um, uh, somebody asks, uh, are the eggs chosen for any particular qualities? Well, I mean, I kind of, it's always best, you know, if I had the option mostly to, if, especially with chicken eggs to get, you know, something that's farm raised, but you know, far, you know, most, most chicken eggs that are farm raised are brown because we have this weird thing in this country about brown eggs or fresh eggs. And so for instance, uh, you know, it just, I mean, I could work with brown eggs, but you know, you don't get the same color story if you don't have a white egg. You know, the whole, the whole pop of this design is obviously because there's a very extreme between white and black and all the colors in between. You know, when you're working with a brown egg, you get that as well, but it's, it's not as much. I mean, so yeah, I mean, it would be preferable, um, but a lot of times I'm just buying, like with chicken eggs, commercial white eggs. Now, mind you, I'm also working with other eggs like duck eggs, goose, emu, ostrich, rhea, and, uh, you know, those larger shells I'm getting from either from the farms that are raising them or through people who sell eggs to others who work with eggshells. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Okay, a, a couple of more questions. Are, are the egg design motifs also used in Ukrainian embroidery? Yes, oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I'll go back here to this one, this one page you could see especially on the, on the Hutzel one, just because I could see it very easily, yeah. And, and how, do you, how do you blow out the egg? Um, generally what I do, depending on, see, sometimes I make eggs as ornaments for Christmas, for instance. So I'll, I'll, I'll use a Dremel tool and I'll poke a hole and use a Dremel tool because, and I'm usually doing it after I've lacquered the eggs around 10 times. So I've protected the shell before I even drill it. So, um, yeah. And, and if I'm just needing what, you know, if I'm doing something that only needs one hole, then there's this kind of crooked pipe. It's an air pipe that I blow into the egg that allows the insides to come out and then I can clean it out. So. Hey, thanks. And the larger, all the larger shells I get are usually already blown out. They're just shells. So. Hey, thanks. Sure. Um, so is the, should we move on? Sure. Okay. Um, so this next slide is showing you two different ways in which you can be petite an egg. And again, the left one, this is an ostrich egg and it, oh, there you are, the Cossacks crossroad design, again, writ large on an ostrich shell. Okay, now what I'm showing you on the left side is essentially the same technique, but done differently in order. And I've done, because I've done a lot of this and there's gonna be a whole section later in this presentation about copying Attic Black and Greek pottery design which I've done a lot of, and this is also an ostrich shell. I did this particular egg, I think in the mid nineties. And um, so, but the difference in doing what this, this, uh, this is from what's called a Panathenaic vase that's in the Metropolitan Museum. It's, 
it shows the runners in the race. Um, one of the things I've learned about that, just as a side historical interest, is that those amphorae that have those sports images on it, what you, the amphora was not the prize. What was in the amphora was the prize. And what was on the outside of the amphora was just the decoration for the event you won. But what you were winning was 32 liters of pure olive oil. That was the winning that was inside the amphora. So that was just kind of an interesting thing to realize. And to me, it's also kind of interesting because it's kind of similar to the egg thing. Like the decoration is a language about what's in the egg just like the decoration on this amphora is about what's in the amphora. So, um, so what I'm doing in order to get this image is I'm dyeing the whole egg orange first. And then I'm using either the traditional stylist or the pen I was just mentioning in order to draw in the image that you're seeing. Now, so you see anywhere that you see orange had to be covered with wax. Okay, so then after that, I'm then, I think with this one, this was an earlier form of this. So I was just bleaching this egg back to white. That's why you see the white up here is really white. Okay, and so then what I'm doing is that I'm filling in with wax that area that was white. And then I'm dyeing the egg black. And then after the egg is dyed black, the wax is removed. And then after the wax is removed, this one was pretty heavily lacquered. So that's how that process works. So again, it's still batiking on an egg. It's still the traditional process, but done differently in order to get this effect. So um, there's that. This is a totally different process. This is a rhea shell that is dyed brown and then it's scratched. This was also dyed brown and it was also rolled in a blue dye rag. That's why you see this kind of coloration over here. Um, but this is just scratching, I guess graffito you could call it. So it's just scratching against the shell. It's a Nirvana Buddha. It's um, in the collection. There's, um, I've had a relationship with the Slater Memorial Museum in Norwich, Connecticut, and uh, they have several of my pieces and this is one of them. So um, now this is, a similar process to what you just saw. This is dyeing eggs black. This is, a, this is a motif I've worked with a lot. I've liked this idea of putting the image of death on the symbol of life because there's an inherent visual tension about it. This was from a piece that was in a show at Exit Art called Terror Vision. And this was called 21 Skull Salute. This was in 19, this was in 2004. And this was all an art show that was exit art that used to exist as a nonprofit art space was all about looking at the issue of terrorism, because, of course, it was after 9-11 and the resulting wars. Um, so what these eggs are done is um, these are dyed black and then they're scratched. So you can see kind of like scratch lines, as you see, like the teeth are very scratched. And then what I'm doing here is I'm using bleach on a, on a um, Q-tip and I'm bleaching the shell back to white, but there's an interesting thing that happens in which the carbon, because these dyes are aniline dyes, I think there's a chemical reaction between the, anil the carbon in the aniline dye and the bleach, and it gives me this brown tone on the eggshell that I really like. So it's just, it's part of the, the process of, of, you know, how far does one go? It's that kind of dance of, like playing with how the color shows up. Now, unfortunately, I didn't put any images in here of a whole art project that I did that was related to these. So I'll just tell you about it. In 2004 at St. At, uh, St. Mark's uh, in the Bowery, I did a public art ritual, as I called it, that was protesting the Iraq war. And I invited the public to come and make skull eggs. And we mounted them in the cemetery yard for three weeks from Columbus Day to election day, which in 2004 was happened to be the day of the dead. So there was all kind of like the symbologic resonance with going on from Columbus Day to the day of the dead in relationship to reelecting George Bush again. And so that was my response to trying to do it. And, you know, as a public art phenomenon, we had over a thousand people participating and made around 1500 eggs that were then piled 
in the cemetery yard outside through all the weather. And they were um, not protected other than I think I did put some, we put some kind of beeswax covering on them. But um, I unfortunately don't, didn't put any slide images from that show in this slideshow. And I would have liked to have shown you just like how amazing it was because each person made a different type of a skull. And so each skull was different. And so it really gave this idea of individuating the deaths that had happened because what I was trying to achieve was visually what we weren't allowed to see with the press in which even if you remember the caskets of the American servicemen who had been killed, you knew weren't allowed to see those images of them coming home. There was all that, you know, media squash. So anyway, so this was my response of trying to work with eggs and do this thing around skull eggs as a, as a public ritual response. So, um, so that's that. <clears throat> Here's a whole other thing of what to do, of something I've done with eggs. These are rhea shells, and these are made to obviously look like roses. And these are attached to rose stems that had been growing in my garden where I was living in Brooklyn. This process of working with this um, is a combination of dyeing these roses pink first and then doing a wax outline of the petals and also if you see on the leaf you can see that the leaf is outlined in pink and then what i'm doing from there is you know recoloring the leaves green waxing that in and then removing uh, dyeing everything um red and then removing the wax. And then after that, I'm further affecting the image of the, the petal by scratching at it in order to heighten the light. And then painting on purple underneath in order to give it some shadow and some three dimensionality. So this is like a sculptural piece that I've done with eggs. I've done it on chicken shells, but this is a whole piece I did um, on rhea shells. Here's a whole other form of working with batik. Um, and this is again, working in the etching process. Um, these are emu shells. The colors you're seeing beside the golden background where I'm kind of applying a light gold gouache, the different color greens you're seeing are layers of shell. And what I'm doing is using the wax resist to capture that color before I set the egg into a vinegar bath that eats at the shell and gives you a, cause the deeper one goes into these shells, the lighter the shell tone gets. So what I'm doing is capturing the shell tone color by wax as the resist to not a dyeing process, but an etching process. So this is a close up of the globe. So these are in a sense, three layers of color. The, the land area is the outermost layer, which is, it's that dark. It's like a really dark forest green that almost is black. And I have to tell you, it's kind of not easy to do this because I'm working with wax that gets darkened by a candle. So my wax is black. So I'm, walk, I'm kind of like drawing like flat black on a kind of shiny black surface. And so it's just kind of like difficult to see what I'm doing. But then what I'm doing is after the land area is fully waxed in and then I'm sitting the egg in vinegar for maybe like an hour. And I'm getting down to this color that you're seeing, this lighter bluish greenish tone. And then I'm doing these circles in wax and then I'm doing it again. And then after I do it again for a while, I'm, uh, you know, make like another hour there is then i'm brushing in the this is like gold gouache that's been uh wet watered down so it's it's not so thick and then what i'm doing is brushing that on and then removing the wax because the interesting thing about the gold gouache is that it doesn't get it doesn't come off when i'm like heating the egg to remove the wax so that's that's how that is done and there is nothing on this shell like there's no lacquer on it or anything. This is just the shell you're seeing, all the colors. Here's a close up of like similar, again, routine with the, the octopus egg that you saw earlier. 
So again, these different color lines, the different tones you're seeing again are different layers of shell. Um, this is a particularly um, Minoan style octopus that I particularly like. Uh, you know, there's various types of pottery that I've really fallen in love with. And the whole Minoan uh, period is a real favorite of mine. Um, are there any questions about this whole technique? Any questions, anybody? Maybe that, okay. This is, um, this is another piece in that whole series. Also, this was actually bought by the museum. This is something that I call my constructivist design. The way this egg is broken up is by writing a line that intentionally doesn't meet. Because in all traditional line drawing, like it's always like you meet the line on the other side. And what I'm doing here is intentionally drawing the line so it won't meet. And then I'm constantly turning the egg and drawing this line and then picking it up after times and putting it back down. And what it does is it shatters the space of the egg into these kind of fractal spaces that are, you know, rhomboids and triangles and parallelograms. And, and so, and I think of this as being influenced by constructivism. Um, and then what I did with this particular piece is that in those spaces, I then inserted traditional Ukrainian design into those weird spaces. And again, the different tones of color you're seeing are different layers of the shell. I think this is like maybe five different layers you're seeing of different color on this particular piece. So what you're seeing now is in a sense, the same process, but with emu shell that has been adhered to board before it was worked on. So, um, this is a, this is I'm giving you like work that's happening right now in my studio in preparation for a show I have this summer in Provincetown at a gallery that's been showing my work. And so um, this is a piece that's based on a charcoal drawing I did while being on the Delaware River at a friend's house upstate. And the different kind of colors you're seeing is all eggshell and interesting like that big, heavy, dark hill on the right side that's mirrored in the water is a type of black emu shell that I've recently discovered exists. I always thought they were green. There are some that are black, there are some that are kind of brownish. So the kind of middle part of this landscape is brown shell. And so what I'm doing is I'm using the wax resist process and the same etching process that you just saw on those other eggs on shell that's been already epoxied to board. The epoxy that I work with is white. So that's why you see that white in the cracks. And what I'm doing then is I'm using um, wax as a resist in the etching process again. And then after I remove the wax, I'm still cutting in with a knife. So all of these kind of lines you're seeing on the water are all kind of cut in with a heavy knife that I'm working with in order to get in these very thin lines in deeper layers in shell. So, um, you know, that this is just one piece of this whole series I'm not working with. Um, Paul, uh, somebody's asking, do you design, do you design, do your design completely uh, uh, before you start to wax the egg? I mean, generally, yes. I mean, generally, because within this process, it's really difficult to remove wax. Now I've come to learn how to do it. But generally with this process, again, um, you need to know where you're going. So you need to know when wax goes where and whenever. So generally the whole thing is mapped out ahead of time. Now, we would joke about this when we'd be teaching people how to do it, that if you like sometimes wax blobs, you know, the whole phenomenon of if anybody's worked with wax, the hotter it is, the faster it runs. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if your wax tool blobs, then you have a new design. You know, that's kind of what we say to people. No, I've, re I've learned how to like deal with um, a sharp X-Acto blade and some naphtha is what I use anyway to uh, remove wax. But yeah, it's generally all, it's pre-constructed. Um, now with this whole process though, with this, 
there are things that I did a lot of afterward that I didn't think I was going to do in order to like detail the piece. So, and just to give you a sense, this piece is about, I would say it's like 11 by 16 inches, just to give you a sense of its size. So. And somebody is asking, do you use individual shell pieces or are they connected in any way or? Um, I'm not necessarily understanding the question. Me neither. Uh, maybe if, if the person, uh, see the thing, one thing about like, this is another piece in the same series. So the sh if you look at the top of the piece, you'll notice that um, the shell color is kind of grayish and down below the shell color is heavy dark green. Again, this is the differential in shell color. So if the person was asking like what this would be is like, I would probably be working from breaking apart the same shell for the top area and a different shell for the bottom area. Um, just to, you know, because I'm working with different tones of color. And again, this line drawing you're seeing was, was wax laid down as the piece was etched. Um, you know, again, you could see cut in lines along here as well after the piece was done. So, all right. Um, now this piece, this slide, um, I'm showing you kind of start to finish in a way. And I'm gonna show you something that's kind of interesting about this is that this is cassowary shell you're looking at. Cassowary is a, an amazing bird if you know about them. They're kind of, they're really living dinosaurs. Like they haven't really evolved since the, di the dinosaur period in a way, uh, they're from Northern Australia and, Pap and then from Papua New Guinea. And um, they, so the, what you're seeing is a piece and you're seeing on the left, the drawing I did for the piece in my drawing book. And what it is, is this is actually an ode to a really dear friend of mine who just died. And um, what I'm using is what's called Athenian geometric pottery design. This is a period that's even before Attic, uh, Attic Black and Attic Red Pottery. This is maybe seventh century BC. You might've seen these tall funerary urns in the Metropolitan Museum. They've got several of them in the, in the early Greek period. Um, and they show these funerary scenes. And the reason I did this particular piece for this friend is that um, like oh, a couple of years ago, a friend came up from Florida from a cassowary farm and brought me broken cassowary shells, which I'd never worked with, but they're really rare. I mean, if we wanted to get a cassowary shell, like a whole one, they're, they're rather expensive. They're like $200 each for a cassowary shell. But I, you know, these guys had found these, this, <laughs> they had met these guys who ran a cassowary farm. And so they brought me these broken shells. And so I adhered them to these two boards. And then I thought, what am I going to do with this? because they're so unique. And so it was at that point I realized I wanted to do this homage to my friend who had just died because he was incredibly unique. So, um, and so I decided to use this kind of double board experience. So, so what you're seeing though in the middle board is just the shell itself. And so you're seeing the outer layer of different cassowary shells. So you see there's kind of a range of tone color, but they're much lighter than emu shells. And then the piece as it's finished on the right is the same process I was telling you about where it's again, the darker colors you're seeing are the outer layers of the shell and then I'm etching it and going into deeper layers. Now, especially if you look at the, the, the bottom piece on the right side, one of the things that I love about cassowary shells is that celadon color that kind of pops up in that key design, especially. Like that's a color that, is deep within that shell. And it's just, to me, it's just gorgeous. And all I had to do was like reveal it, you know? So, yeah. Uh, I, um, I was just wondering what kind of a bird or is a cassowary? I've never heard of it. A cassowary, it is a large land animal. It's a land bird, land running bird. It's not as big as an emu, but it's about that size. It lays an egg that is, uh, you know, similar to the size of an emu shell, maybe slightly smaller because it's a slightly smaller bird. It's this, um, 
it's got the thing about this bird is that as it ages, it's got this blue horn that comes out of its head and on the top of its bill. And it and it as it the older the bird, the larger this horn is. All I could say is look them up because, and the thing that's interesting about these birds is that um, they're endangered. So there's real prospect that they might become extinct because their loss of habitat, because they're incredibly private and they're incredibly uh, dangerous. There's a hook barb on their foot that will disembowel you if you approach their nest. Yikes. Yeah, no, no, so they're seriously dangerous birds. In fact, there was a story last year of some guy in Florida who raised cassowaries that was killed by one. There's someone, you know what I mean? So yeah, mm -hmm. in any event. But they're they're crazy. They're interesting birds. But again, they're this unique color. You know, that's the thing about them. And, and how do you spell that? Uh, C a s s o w a r y, cassowary. Got it. Thank you. Sure. And and somebody's asking: Are the eggs that thick that you can etch? You can etch down through them without cracking the shells or the pieces of the shells, can you? Well, the thing uh, is, is that these, these pieces have already been adhered to board. And oh, so they're, oh. they're really like, and the, the epoxy I'm using is incredibly strong. And so they're set in there. And so they're not gonna really crack anymore because, oh, the other thing I should also tell you, which I didn't even go into, I mean, part of the crazy process that I have to deal with is that in order for, this shell to be permanently adhered to the epoxy, I have to remove the inner lining. You know, that kind of, you know, it's essentially the placenta of the egg. You know, that paper on the inside, that has to be removed if I'm gonna make sure that the eggshell is permanently adhered. So I have to like do that first before the shell is even, you know, applied to the epoxy. Um, and it's interesting with these larger shells, there's actually like a couple of different layers of of that paper, as it were. So in any event, um, yeah, so they're really, they're adhered. Now, the, in terms of doing this kind of etching process with a whole egg, you know, just on itself as an object, not breaking it apart. Again, the shell, the shell is very strong. And so it can adhere, it can deal with the pressure. Like for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm sinking it because it's hollow. I'm having to cork it up and sink it into vinegar with a weight on it, right? So, it, but it, that doesn't bother the shell. You know, they're really, I kind of show people sometimes I'll have a shell and I'll literally bang it against my head. And it's just like, you know, they're really, they're incredibly strong. The, the larger shells, I'm talking about emu, rhea, um, ostrich, uh, casper, so, yeah. All right. Um, now I'm gonna move on to a whole section and this is just kind of be themed around images of the globe. Um, to me, coming out of a religious background that thought about iconography a lot. Um, I think about this in my spiritual perspective as being my icon to the world of mother earth and trying to do images of mother earth on eggs as beautifully as possible. I've always loved maps. Ever since I was a kid, I've just loved geography, topography, et cetera. The process of creating these on ostrich eggs, and these are two very different ones. The one on the right was actually done in the early mid nineties. And it was a technique that you see wasn't done on the one on the left, was done later. So you see kind of an evolution in how I'm working with them. On the one on the right, you see, I actually outline in a like a tan color, all of the continents and then what I'm doing is I'm painting with the egg dye as a watercolor technique to give you that sense of topography. What I'm doing on the right is I've, I've gotten rid of that idea of having to outline in wax. I am outlining with pencil as I'm doing these, but again, I'm working with the dye as a watercolor medium. And then so that the land area all gets waxed in and then I'm dyeing the egg blue the one on the right was done earlier. The one on the left includes a type of dyeing that I'm doing. So if you see in the ocean area, there's the colors kind of modeled. What I've been doing a lot is um, rolling eggs in 
I, you know, what my dye rags, I use paper for as my dye rags and I just allow them to get saturated with dye and they kind of get crumpled and then I keep reusing them. And so what I'm doing is then applying these kind of heavily dyed rags to a wet shell when it comes out of the dye to finish the dyeing process to give me a, you know, a, you know, a, a lovely textured look to instead of just being flat color. So that's part of, you know, my process in working with, with dye and paper. So um, anyway, so these are ostrich eggs. I've done like scores of these in chicken eggs, goose eggs, but I'm showing you ostrich eggs. Um, now this is putting chicken shell onto board and then doing the same process. This piece was maybe 40 by 30 inches. Um, the one thing, uh, no, that's not true of this piece. Never mind. I'm going to show you something different with the next piece that's similar to this. But um, this is again, and one of the things you should notice also if it's kind of, no, I think this is really interesting. I think with this piece, what you're looking at is eggshell that's laid down so that you're seeing actually the inside of the shell. You're not seeing the exterior of the shell because if you notice the way the eggshell looks more concave rather than convex like each shell piece is a little cup as it were than a hump right in this piece that's because that's the inside of the shell one of the things i'm finding is that sometimes the inside of the shell takes color more deeply than the outside and part of that process, part of that possibility is because, again, the way commercial eggs are handled and cleaned and bleached, all of that process of cleaning an egg from market reduces the calcium on the outside of the shell that doesn't allow it to die as deeply. So the inside of the shake actually takes dye more deeply than the outside. And sometimes when I'm doing this, so I would have laid the shell down where I'm adhering the outside of the shell to the epoxy. And sometimes I'm leaving on the paper, the inside paper, as it were, that, you know, the placenta I talked about having to remove. And you can see, for instance, on places on this map where the color is especially dark, especially in the mountain ranges, et cetera, that's because there's paper there. And the paper is really soaking in the color more deeply than just the shell. And then what I'm doing is that when I finished this piece, it would have been lacquered. So all of that would have been sealed in. Paul, uh, there, people are asking what kind of dyes do you use and uh, what kind of uh, uh, longevity or archivalness do, the, do these pieces have? Well, um, I'm working mostly with aniline dyes. Um, there is problems I've discovered along the way, especially with my blues, with it being UV sensitive. And so that just has to be taken into account with their care afterwards. Um, though I've just, I found through pieces that I've done years ago that I've seen that <clears throat> with any of this collage work, as long as the piece had been heavily lacquered, it seems to be protected then afterward. So that's been my experience so far. I mean, aside from the UV sensitivity issue of this blue. So. Yeah. Um, so here's two different other ways in which I've worked with globes imagery. The one on the left was from a series I did called Flatlands, in which I kind of divided the world up into different flat boards. And I did like the New World and I did like Europe and Africa. And then I did, you know, I kind of separated. And just as this is one of them. And the difference with this that I wanted to show you is that the land area is actually the outside of brown shell. And all of the water area are the inside of shells. Okay, so I'm, what I'm doing is I'm playing with the, with the convexity of the concavity of the shell. And also, if you notice how deep that blue is on the ocean there, it's because again, there was paper of the inside shell really taking in the blue. But if you notice, for instance, Greenland up top, um, it's kind of a bit of a fuzzy picture. It's not the greatest image, I'm sorry to say, um, is the outside of shell. Though on the far upper left corner, that kind of look of ice in the polar region is the inside of shell. So again, I'm kind of playing with the way the shell looks and the kind of effect it'll give you 
uh, visibly. The piece on the right is something that I, um, uh, an egg that I did in, if you saw the big egg hunt that happened, I believe in the spring of 2014, maybe. It was a fundraiser for Asian elephants that was um, produced by a London uh, NGO that had done this in London and brought it to New York. And I, you know, one had to answer to a call and give a design, but I got in and what I did is I eggshell encrusted the, the egg. And then I did the same treatment you're seeing on the left, on the right, on the egg. And so again, the land area you see are, is brown shell. You know, so you notice how brown Arabia is because I can't get that shell much lighter than that. That's brown shell. You know what I mean? So, but the water area is the inside of shell. And so I, again, this, this egg itself is about three feet tall, you know? So um, it was probably one of the largest, you know, art projects I'd worked on. Um, this was shown in Columbus Circle outside. And I did have an issue with the UV sensitivity of it and I had to ask them to move it because the sun was hitting it every day in certain areas. So some of the ocean areas were starting to get bleached, you know, and I had actually, I'd kind of told them this, you know, as I delivered the piece. So in any event, um, you know, it ended up getting moved inside and all these pieces were auctioned off. Um, what's, um, what's underneath? That's not a three foot e real egg. No, no, no. It's like, it, it's this like plastic, you know, it's kind of, I guess it's a polyethylene or whatever. It's a, it's just a, it was kind of like a milky plastic that was then had a stem already attached to it that goes into the plinth that goes into, you know what I mean? They had this all figured out already. So I was delivered, you know, the, the form, the plastic egg. So, yeah, it was obviously hollow, you know, so, so. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's just to show you again, the, you know, the, the largest, again, I'm just transferring the same idea about the globe, this being like, for me, a central image in my artwork. To me, again, it's about transferring just the be how beautiful the planet is. And to me, to try to just exhort people to just know how beautiful the planet is so that we just become much more ecologically minded, just through being, the, the world just being beautiful. So that's the intention behind this work. Um, I'm going to show you a series of pieces that are just now, we're going to go like really kind of abstract of just different things I've done to play with eggshell. Um, this is a piece, I think it's also in that museum collection. This piece is maybe 14 inches square. And it was just simply, was it brown shell? It was brown shell that was adhered to a thick board. The board is about a, uh, uh, an inch thick. Realize also with all of these pieces that are on wood, there is the eggshell is around the wood, the edges of the wood. So everything you're gonna see is gonna be on the sides of all my pieces. And the way I hang them, they're usually floating off the wall um, is the way I hang them. So this is, the piece was um, dyed blue, or I think it was dyed black. And then when I was drying it, I had all these blue dye rags on it. And so I stained it blue after the black. And then I sanded it. And so these little, you're seeing the outside of shell because you're seeing these little dots that are lighter in color. So I'm getting the blue underneath the black. And then what I did is that I, painted in with gold gouache all of the cracks between all of the shells. So this is just going abstract with surface form and just seeing what shell does by itself. This is uh, it's, this is a, a close-up of a piece that's larger than this. This piece I call 2006. Um, this is taking that spiral design. This is a traditional Ukrainian design. It was, you might've seen some of this similar. This is just repeating spirals around the egg. This piece is actually in Ukrainian called the original egg would be called the bezkonechnik, which means the line that doesn't begin or end. And it represents eternity. And actually in the original design of these spirals, this was meant to be a demon catcher. 
because demons in your house would get caught in the spiral. And so that was, it was a protective amulet, as it were. It was a protective talisman. So what I did is that I took this, and um, I think these are duck eggs that I, I had a bike accident that year. So this kind of represented what happened to me with the bike accident in 2006, in which I just like flattened these out, and then I heavily sanded it. I really, I sanded this really heavily. And so this is, again... You know, batiked eggs broken apart, reassembled to give you this image is how it's done. Again, working with the same epoxy and then heavily sanded. This is <clears throat> those, if you remember those uh, rhea shells earlier that would made look like roses. This is three of them broken apart and reassembled to give you uh, a, what I call the rose mandala. And around the larger shell is just chicken shell. This board, I believe, was maybe two feet square. So again, this is reworking three different rhea shells with that rose pattern and reassembling them to give you this like large rose piece. So again, it's, it's um, breaking the shell apart and then carefully reassembling it is how this happens. Um, these are four, they're somewhat closed up. I, I decided to go on the close up here. This is from a whole series I did in a show in which um, these are collages of squid swimming underwater. So the squid eggs had been painted first. So what I was doing is dyeing all of these eggs in this kind of blue-green tonality and again, wrapping them in dye rags. And then on some of them, I would paint the squid. They all had to be like cleaned out, lacquered, cleaned out, again, cleaning out the back of them and then breaking them apart and reassembling them into a whole series. And I had done about 20 of these boards at one point for a show that I had a few years ago. So these are just four of them, but they were all just working with, I, I, the thing that was interesting about these pieces is that they were wired in such a way that you could hang them. They were all 12 inches square. You could hang them in any direction you wanted. So you could play with the different coloration. And I kind of called it an art game. And I called these pieces ordering chaos. But the idea behind these was just like, you know, playing with this imagery. And this piece is actually right now, these four, are in a show at in Red Hook at the Brooklyn Working Artists Coalition show that's up only through this weekend in Red Hook at their gallery at the end of Van Brunt Street in a show that was called The Elements. And so they were, it was a juried show all about the elements. And so obviously I was giving them water, you know, so it's in that show through this weekend. So this is um, just a real close up of what I call the Red Hot Love Mandala. This is a board that was also, I think, uh, 12 inches square. And this is really just simply eggshell that was put on board. And then the whole board is dyed red. And then I just used a compass and, you know, created lines and then used a compass and then, you know, was bleaching and staining this color red in order to get this, you know, mandala image. I'm, you know, I've, I've, I've looked at a lot of mandala, mandala images of all forms. And so this is one of the ones in which, you know, one of the ones in which I was playing with, I've done other forms, but this is just painting on shell. So this is just painting on shell and then lacquering it and then sanding it. Um, so this piece is um, something I did more recently. This is a, a collage. It's rather small, actually. It's only about on the long side on the left, that's seven inches. The top is maybe five inches. The board is pretty thick. It's almost two inches. This is a collage of a style that I'm doing where I'm working with broken shells that are in my studio and I'm reconnecting it. Um, this piece was in the, small, um, in the small work show at 440 Gallery this past December in Brooklyn and Park Slope. And I'm actually rather happy to say that it won curator's choice for the show. So that was, you know, that was, for me, it was like a real feather in my cap 
you know, I must say. So it was, it was really lovely. Um, this process is the central image was a goose shell that had been dyed black. And then the image is scratched. The central image is a copy of an Edward Curtis photograph of a Navajo masked dancer doing a mask called a Hashabad. And that's the name of the piece. The name is scratched if you see in the lower left corner of the piece. I, I you know, included that. But this is scratching and then also bleach painting in order to give you the detailing of this mask figure. And the thing that was interesting about this figure to me was that it's a male masked figure doing a female deity mask. So to me, that's ritual drag. It's doing a form of ritual drag. And so what I'm doing around it is including pieces of traditional Ukrainian design that I thought fit in with what was the Navajo dancer um, in this small little collage. So, um, yeah, so um, this, you know, I really liked the original goose egg, but unfortunately it did crack at one point or it broke along the way. So it gets, you know, redone. This is what happens in my, I'm constantly... I'm pretty much using anything that breaks in my studio in this collage work. And, you know, that's what I started. I started doing this collage work around 2000. I started really doing, being a professional artist around 91. The idea occurred to me in the late nineties. It wasn't until I moved to New York in 98 that I started doing this kind of thing. And most of the impetus for me doing this work on board was just to have a larger surface to work on. You know, ostrich eggs are only so large. You know, so for me to do larger imagery forced me to like then apply egg to board. Because you have to understand one thing about me is that I don't have any professional art training. This is all self-taught work. Um, I didn't go to art school. You know, so this is the medium I know. And this is the medium I stayed with. Um, so I'm constantly experimenting, partially because I'm fascinated with what eggshells will do. You know, so, um, you know, this is, this is why I'm who I am. So. Here's two more examples of collage work that actually give you very intimate examples of some of my senses of self. The piece on the left is called Transfiguration. The pieces on right is self-portrait as a chort. And chort is a Ukrainian name for a devil. Because actually the figure scratched there was a goose egg that was an image of me on the right. The image, it's also like another image on the left. And so these are just compiled with other pieces of other eggs that were broken in order to give a larger, what I call these are narrative pieces. The narration comes from the combination of what I'm throwing together on that board. Um, so that's, that's what you're seeing here, but it's different eggs. And so like, for instance, on the piece on the right, that was uh, what was a, called it, it was a series called Deviled Eggs in which, <laughs> I was doing deviled head images on eggs as a joke because a friend of mine had literally given me a deviled egg plate, like an antique deviled egg plate. I said, oh, I need to do some deviled eggs. So anyway, so um, yeah, so that's what you're seeing is a, is a collage of different disparate elements brought together to create a new narrative. Um, this piece um, is called Squall. It's also in the museum in Norwich. This piece is I guess you would call it an assemblage. It's a combination of found wood and eggshell. Some of it was pre-batiked eggshell. You see that kind of spiral design in the middle front. Um, I did this in Cape Cod when I was living there for a, a fall and winter from 2011 to 2012. And it's based on experiencing crossing the dunes and seeing a squall in the distance, a, a rain squall where there was sunlight on part of the dunes and there was a squall on part of the dunes from my vantage point. So this is, again, this is, you know, some of this is just shell that's added, shell that I had already, and then it's painted over um, or, and then I'm staining the wood also with egg dye. Um, this piece is maybe 14 inches tall and maybe 20 or 24 inches long with this whole long piece on it, just to give you a sense of size. So, okay, but I'm just curious if there's any questions around this collage work that you're seeing, because again, we're about to move into a whole nother series of another theme of work. 
So I'm just curious if there's any. What one person asked if you're still if you after this are, are you still doing uh, traditional type eggs? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I still I still work on them. Um, though a lot of times currently I've been mostly using them to make like lovely Christmas designs on Christmas eggs and hanging eggs like that. Um, I've had this interesting push pull as an artist professionally feeling my way through what could possibly be a market at Easter, but I've never really tapped into it in the way that I tapped into the Christmas ornament market. And it, it's also like, maybe also like maybe not as large a market. And so that's why I never went down that road as it were just, you know, these kind of, you know, these professional choices we make doing our, you know, cause part of also realized that um, part of my, exploration with doing this is obviously starting with something that one could classify as a folk craft and then working within the same medium and then trying to produce something that I'm calling fine art and you know all of those boundaries and those lines of distinctions and where one sells one's work is kind of gotten blurred but in a way it hasn't and so I had decided because there was a while in which I kind of thought maybe I should just really stay within like the fine craft gallery way of presenting my work because I had done that for a number of years. But I think when I moved, decided to really focus on moving to eggshell on board, I was more interested in working in a fine art venue. I mean, just because, and maybe it's quite honestly, I'll admit that maybe some of it's just an ego trip, quite honestly, I mean, I'm not gonna discount that. But again, I always thought of myself as being an artist and I, and I did one of the things that happened for me was like moving through that notion of how people talk about and hold craft versus art, you know, so, and, and how we then present ourselves in the world and how we think about ourselves as artists. I mean, we're all artists, you know, so, you know, I, in any event, just, you know, sharing some of that that dilemma for me because, and it took me a long time to actually allow myself to call myself an artist is what I'm trying to say, because in the fine art world, because I was coming out of what could be classified as folk art or folk craft, you know? And so, um, yeah, anyway, it's just some of that backdrop. Um, <clears throat> any, other, any other questions I'm gonna move on to? We're gonna go, we're gonna go Greek now as, as it were. So I'm going to show you was a, a series of works, again, that's based in Greek pottery, Attic Black pottery, even though some of the work itself is not off Greek pottery, but I'm using the design style. So I've done a couple of shows at this gallery in Provincetown where I've used this motif. The first show was called Thalassa, and it was all about the sea. I knew that Thalassa meant the sea in Greek. And... Um, and I was doing a whole series of sea creatures, both on board and on eggs. So the, this is a rhea shell that's been batik to look like a codfish is what you're seeing here. And you can see, if you look at it, that there's a lot of etching that has gone on because again, the shell was dyed orange first and then I'm using the wax resist process to fill everything in that that's orange. And then I'm sitting it in vinegar for at least an hour. So if you can look at it, you can see especially in the white areas, you can even see some shadow at points because of the, the edge that I'm able to create by doing the etching process. So then, you know, the, the egg would be, um, you know, brought back to white by sitting it in the vinegar bath because all the dye at that point is removed when you clean the shell off at that point. And then I'm using wax to fill in the white area and then dyeing the egg black and then removing the wax. And then with these, because these are larger shells, I'm, I don't feel I need to lacquer it. So the thing that I like about these is that you're seeing really the grain of the shell. You're seeing the grain and the shell color and it's not being obscured by lacquer. And the thing that's really fun about these pieces is it really, it does have this tactile sense about it because of the, the graininess of the shell and the edge that gets created with the uh, etching um, and wax resist process. So here's, here's a cot on, you know, two images of a cot on a rhea shell. This is kind of a close up of an ostrich shell that had an image of Dionysus. Um, this is a kind of a direct copy of a famous 
I think it's in a drinking cup. I think it's called a kylix. And on the inside of the drinking cup was this image of uh, Dionysus in a boat. And there's all these jump dolphins jumping around him. And, uh, but I'm only giving you this one side of the version. But one of the things about this boat is actually the boat itself is a copy of the Widda, which is this famous pirate ship that was um, had sunk off of Wellfleet and had been discovered mm, about 20 years ago. And there's now a museum, but it's kind of like a full pirate ship that had sunk. And so what I was doing is I was putting, I was making Dionysus arrive in Provincetown in the Widda. So I was connecting Dionysus and everything that Dionysus represents with pirates. So that was kind of like the fun idea about this. The thing you can't see about this is that, because I'm only showing you this one image, is that, you know, around the egg, you see images of the, the, what, the what you would see of like the, the beach and the dunes from the water is what you're seeing. So again, this is an ostrich shell. Again, same process. So you can see that etching that, the depth of that etching, you know, within these lines. Um, this is a take on that famous Hokusai wave image, right? So I'm kind of copying that Japanese thing. The thing that I, again, on a real shell, the one thing I want to point out about one of the reasons why I love this shell is that you see that orange and that kind of mottled orange color that was from the dye rags. And that is something that is not in my control, but something when it shows up like that, I love. It's one of my, you know, the fun things that happen. I think, I don't know about how you folks think about working in your craft modes or whatever media you're working in, but I think of my doing artwork like this is a constant dance between chaos and control. And so there's obviously the control of this line drawing but there's the chaos of the dying that gives me various color schemes in this whole phenomenon. Now, the fun thing about this is that, you know, in the original Hokusai print, you have these guys in rowboats. And what I decided to put here instead is, and this is kind of like a typical fisherman's trawler in P-Town is the boat on the left. So that's what, I, you know, again, this is for a Provincetown gallery. So, um, so this is now moving into the show I did last year, which was called Olympiada. And so I'm sh I was showing images related to the Olympics because the Summer Olympics were, you know, postponed to last year. Now, this particular image is a small ostrich egg. And again, I want to point out the dye job, that coloration of the orange. Again, is that modeled color finish. Um, now, this is actually not based on pottery design, but this is actually a recapitulation of a famous bronze statue from the classical Greek period of what's called the discobolos, which is the discus thrower. So, of course, what I'm playing with, I'm able to do on a shell, and the way I arrange the figure is the way the figure wraps around the shell in terms of like then playing with what the spherical space of the shell can do to like representing sculpture. So that's what this is trying to show you here. Um, and this has a light, you'll notice it does have a light um, coating of lacquer on it. That's why it's got a bit of shine because of course, again, it's because of, you know, just protecting this particular shell and doing that for you. Uh, but one of the things I did also is that I would have rubbed down the exterior, the orange in um, steel wool to bring it back to a more matte surface so that on pieces like this, like the black is shinier than the orange. So I'm playing again against shine against matte. It's just a differentiation in how light hits the piece. Um, this is a very close-up image of an ostrich shell that has a classic image that comes from a side of, uh, I think, a, a, an amphora, but it's two wrestlers. Um, and again, this is off of a, it is a copy off of a piece of Greek pottery. But what I'm able to do here is show you how the figures then work around the shell. So to give you an imagination of the fun I have with the way the, sh the figure lands on the shell and how then this arching of the front figure causes this figure to arch 
and he's kind of like, he, you know, in a sense, when you look at the piece, he's kind of arched on his back. And so he looks powerless, even though he's on top, because he's about to be flipped. And you see the way his body just kind of envelops the whole shell at that point. Again, this is part of the fun of doing this kind of figure work on shell. So now this is taking the same design motif idea. This was the, from the, the Thalassa show from two years ago, or two shows ago. This is collaging together eggs that had been previously made in these images that are then broken apart and reassembled. So for instance, these fish images were done on goose eggs first. So they were on larger shelves. But for instance, all of that wave action and all of these other little like creatures that you see happening in here, those were all done on chicken shells. And so for instance, I could get four or five waves per egg, you know, as I was doing them. So in order to do this series, and I did a series of like nine of these boards, I had to just do like a, you know, like a few dozen of these, just the wave eggs. And the thing that just to tell you is that, you know, the way the, the wave motif was laid down and the egg was broken apart and reassembled on the board like this was to, um, and done in a way that it wasn't perfectly laid out, was obviously to show like what happens with imagery underwater. So the distortion of looking through something underwater, because what I'm doing is kind of working off that idea of say like the Pompeian mosaics, the floor mosaics, the Roman floor mosaics. And if you were looking through water at the images below, this is kind of how they would work. And the, the image kind of just gets distorted because of looking underwater. So that's why they're, I mean, they're perf they're, you know, <laughs> they're laid out to do that, you know? So, um, just to show you, and this is, so I did these things as quartets and that's how I showed them. So, you know, and you know, this was particularly fun. I have to tell you that in this whole series, I think the bottom right piece was one of my favorites. I just loved the flounder and the bottom left piece with the horseshoe crab. There's just something graphically about them that I really enjoyed doing when I did this whole series. So this is, again, this is one way of making artwork through this process of doing the eggs first and then breaking them apart and reassembling them. This is a close up of the, uh, this is a striped bass is what this is. So this is just giving you a close up of one of them and what they end up looking like. So, and of course you could see that there's a lot of variation in orange tonality because of the different shells that were applied when they were applied, because I was just dyeing a lot of shells and had them available to work with. This is the kind of showpiece for this show. This is called Thalassa, and this is based on a, actually of a Hellenistic period floor mosaic of Thalassa. And it turns out when I looked up Thalassa in Wikipedia, it turns out that she's the primordial goddess of the sea. I didn't realize that. I just thought it meant the sea, but I didn't realize that there was a goddess. This is from the pre-Olympian gods. Um, so she and Pontus, her consort, are the ones that are responsible for creating all of the sea creatures. And so that's why this, this is an image that is kind of like a direct copy as it were, especially her image of her. So she's always holding an oar and she's holding a dolphin and she is wrapped in seaweed. Um, you know, and if you kind of look in the water there, there's all kind of creatures in the water, there's creatures flying around the water. You know, this is a very fun piece that I did um, for the show. And I would say this piece is maybe, maybe two feet square. This is just to give you a sense of the size. So, and so for instance, the Thalassa image is uh, three different goose eggs. So I'm having to do is like break up the piece and conceive of just doing that part. So I probably did her head on one goose egg. And then I did the oar and the arm attached to the oar in that section of her body on another piece. And then I would have done maybe the other hand with the dolphin and then the rest of the body with her, you know, breast showing there on another egg. 
you follow me, and then having to reassemble them. So that's how this type of collage work and image work gets done. So I'm kind of, because I think we're gonna move into another style of work around this style. I'm just curious if there's any questions around this um, style of image creation. So, all right, so this is last year's show. So this is batiking on eggshell that's been already applied to wood. So instead of creating an image where I'm doing eggs separately, I'm applying the eggshell to board, and then I'm doing the batiking process on the eggshell already on board. And so I was doing contemporary Olympic figures that way in this black figure style. So I was, this is Jesse Owens. And this was from the title card of the show. This is that famous image from Mexico City with uh, John Carlos and uh, Tommy Williams, you know, doing the, the, the black salute. Um, one of the things that happens, for instance, if you look at his right arm raised, you can't see it in the image here, but um, I'm using the three dimensionality of a thick board that his fist is showing up on the other edges to give it three dimensionality. Now, what I'm gonna do quickly here is show you how I did Simone Biles. It's gonna be a bit of a process. So I'm showing different shots in its generation. So what I did is I, I looked up and found that this is the image I wanted to replicate on one of my boards because I, I just love the grace of the image. So what I did next was a drawing in my drawing book. And you, you see also is like, I ended up altering like the way her arm went on the right side in order to emphasize something about the, the image. And then what I did is I already had this board and this board is again, it's about a foot square and it's already got the eggshell on it. And if you can see, I'm kind of like, I'm using, uh, actually I found it almost impossible to draw with pencil on this surface because it's just like crusty eggshell. So I was having to use a brush and dye to outline the form of the figure before I started waxing it, okay? And so then what I did is then I waxed it in. So you see, um, there's some detailing here that's not done yet, but this is essentially what happens. So the whole board has to get covered in wax, um, you know, in order for this figure to come through. And then after the, it's done, and then I'm putting it into a vinegar bath to go back to white underneath the orange. So the image looks like this. And then while it was, that image, I'm then drawing in all of the white detailing you'll see, especially in her gym outfit. And this is the piece when done. You see, once the wax is removed. So you see, obviously, I didn't show you the part where I like waxed in all of that white, but that white was all waxed in when the figure was white before the whole board is dyed black and then all of the wax is removed. And how do you remove that wax, that last step? I was, I've been using a heat gun and literally like heating the wax. And then I'm having to go in and I have to tell you, I have to canoodle between the cracks and the wax. And it, it takes me days afterwards to clear all the wax off of it. It's one of the things I learned in this process that I hadn't anticipated, but it was one of the things that happened. So each of these boards would take like a week to do, you know, in process. Now I'm gonna end up with a couple other things just to show you what other things I've done and where I'm kind of, you know, where I've gone in some ways is that this is a tree in the backyard where I'm living in Jersey City that was a dead pine tree that was about two stories tall. And so what I've done is I've eggshell encrusted pretty much the tree trunk. I, I, there's a certain part on the very left you'll see didn't get, I didn't have a ladder that could reach that. But I'm using the same epoxy and I'm using brown and white shell to create images um, but then I'm just applying it to the tree. And what has happened, this happened like four years ago. And what's happened since is that the brown shell, I've never done anything on this tree. It was kind of an experiment to see what it would look like, but it's an idea I'm really interested in going toward in making totemic sculptures with tree trunks and eggshell encrusting them. It's kind of, I, you know, I kind of got inspired to do this. And then weirdly enough, I went to Australia and started seeing the wooden trunk and image of the wooden carving that happens among the aboriginals. And I was kind of like, oh my God, it's kind of the same thing I'm wanting to do. But anyway, I'm just having this idea of doing this kind of sculptural work where I'm taking a dead trunk 
and totally eggshell encrusting it. And I'm going to just leave you with one final image, which is something I did years ago in a show, which was a series of eggshell mobiles. You know, and so they're just kind of pretty floating orbs that catch light. And these are duck shells. And the reason I use duck shells was because actually when the eggshell, when light really hits them, duck shells can be somewhat translucent, certain duck shells. So they were really pretty in that, in that just white floating, floating in space. So, so there you go. There's, there's the world of eggs. Fabulous. Thank you. Well, thank yes, you. it thank was you. fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would let you know that, by the way, I don't know if anybody's interested, because given where you are, my studio here is here in Jersey City, but we are having open studios tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And if anybody's interested, maybe forward me your email address if you're interested in being on my email list. So that's all I'd say about that. So. How often do you do that? Um, in there are these they're quarterly they're the first friday of so it would be june september december uh march i believe every quarter there it's a citywide open studio event that happens there's also an annual event which is the first weekend in october which is a citywide annual open studio event that pretty much everybody in the city works you know you know participates in and has, there's a lot of other arts programming that happens that weekend as well so oh, I was I was wondering Paul when you're making the mosaics are you using tweezers um sometimes if I'm just needing to do some detailing around you know some piece has like broken apart weirdly and some piece that I want to make sure gets seen you know has to be in the image I'm either using like tweezers or exacto blades to just kind of pick up these little pieces and get them resettled. Mm -hmm. And did, when you, you oh, oh, I just just one more thing when you when you're shaping the pieces to fit into the mosaic, do you do you chip away with them uh, with, from them with something or like a tile cutter or something like that? Or um, well, sometimes what I'm doing sometimes if I'm needing to just like I have a shell that if I'm needing to be careful about the way I break it apart, what I'll do is I'll take an, and usually it's already been, oh, I see someone has some styluses, kiske, we would call them. Is this what you use? Yes, 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 exactly. It's exactly the tools, yes. We call them kiske, which is a, is a diminutive term for the verb, for the word for bone. I think they might have used bones first as, you know, maybe their first tools. And that's what they call that. Um, but uh, let me get back to the, the, the other question just to make sure that I'm fully answering it. Um, and did I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Starting well, to say that when you, you break something that you want to make sure it gets in the right way. You were starting oh, that's what it was. What I would do is that I would take an exacto blade to it and just literally kind of like I could cut a line somewhat with a very sharp exacto blade on the shell and then just carefully break it apart so that the way it gets broken apart, that the piece that I want to make sure stays together is as together as it can be. I mean, one has to be kind of yeah, again. I most likely would have already lacquered these shells a few times at least. So they're not as delicate though. You know, the problem with eggshells is that, you know, once they start breaking, they just keep breaking. You know, you have to, you have to be just careful with your hands, you know, and how you work with them. So. Would you ever uh, not remove the wax in between all the crevices so that it would could appear like colored grout, since that seems like such an arduous task, would it be okay or would you consider leaving it? No, because what I ended up finding, because actually in one of the pieces, I didn't clean it out as well as I had. It, it was kind of like when I was doing this whole process, I noticed by the third piece, it really needed to happen. And on the second piece, I hadn't. And then I, I had to go back and reclean it because what I found was is that the orange, wasn't popping like the, the, the because the the little bits of black it's amazing how it would almost be an imperceptible tone of dark black that would show up in the crevasse in between these shells and the whole thing is 
you know, each shell chip is about the size, say, of my fingernail, my pinky fingernail. So everything around that might have a black edge to it. So what that did, I found, was it dulled the quality of the orange. And obviously, okay. graphically for that piece, the thing that graphically causes it to pop is not only the brightness of the orange, but the extreme between the white and the black on either side of that. You know what I mean? So if the orange is not bright enough, then I'm not gonna be able to get the effect I want. It just, it just dulled it. So, it was, so that's what ended up happening. I just wondered, you kept referring to the different layers of the eggshell. How many layers in an eggshell? Well, I was specifically talking about the work I was doing with emu shells and cassowary oh, the shells, bigger, bigger the ones. bigger shells. So I don't know exactly how thick those shells are, but I don't know, like a 64th of an inch or something, or you one would have to get out a micrometer, I suppose, to right, really measure it. Right. But there is enough thickness there that, again, there are, um, you know, there, we're really talking about millimeters difference, you know, in difference in layers, uh, you know, and even beyond millimeters. But again, there is just this tonal color change that happens the deeper you go into mm -hmm. the shell. I think that the use of the folk art and then your, your knowledge of Greek art and Minoan art and then bringing it together in very contemporary ways is just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you know, you. a really strong work. And um, I think it'd be great to see it in person. I think well, thanks. That, yeah. Yeah. Well. I think that we lose the texture, but I loved how the um, the dye made the different areas um, really like painting. Yeah. And, no. And it, the it, texture we don't yeah. sense as much, but wonderful work. Well, well thank you. Thank you. Really yeah. wonderful work. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I modeled color, there. modeled color has been a really fun thing for me because again, traditionally, it's just flat dyeing. It's just like flat color. You know what I mean? Right. So again, this for me was like taking it to a different level of what you could see. I loved what you said about chaos and control. Mm. <laughs> yes, it, it's, it's a constant dance, you know what I mean? Because, you know. We want something to look a particular way. So there's going to be a lot of control to make that happen. But, you know, the materials themselves, you know, may act in a particular way, you know, or do something that one wasn't expecting. But, you know, of course, that's part of the fun, right? I mean, we, we <laughs> learn new things constantly. And, you know, again, you know, um, I think like, for instance, learning about modeled color was because there was a problem in the dyeing. Like I wasn't getting flat color. And then I thought, oh, look at that. You know what I mean? And, you know, so um, there are certain things that I've learned along the way where something would seem like, oh, well, that was a problem. Well, the problem wasn't a problem. It was just a different way of getting, achieving a different effect. You know, yeah. so. Accidents are the best. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't quite understand how you empty the egg. I think you said you had one hole. Well, if I'm, I might, if I'm doing it with one hole. How would you, I, where does the air go? How does the well, air get in? There's a crooked pipe, an, a, an air pipe that I'm literally using and I'm holding, it's like a little metal pipe that has a crook. So it gives you, it gives you the possibility of part of the pipe is 90 degrees from where the, you know, you blow the air in so that you could stick it into the eggshell to hold the eggshell vertically. And by sticking the pipe in just and blowing air in, it causes all the pressure inside to cause all of the inside of the egg to come out. But how big is the hole? It's maybe, uh, maybe a quarter of an inch in diameter. Oh, quarter of an inch, that's big. Yeah. Maybe. So I how Maybe. do you close it up? And the how do you close it up um, when um, the piece is done? Well, then it you know it depends on what I'm doing with it. But if it, if it's a self, often what I like to do is um, I'll put some sand in the egg and then use a flat gold button. 
that I glue to the hole. And as long as the button is flat, because of the sand in the egg, it allows the egg to self-stand. Oh, that's See? clever. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I used to use a jewelry finding, but lately I'm finding that I like these gold buttons. And, you know, there may be, they're only like a quarter of an inch an inch high, but they're like, you know, it's a nicer way to finish them off. Unfortunately, you know, again, you know, given the choices I had for what I wanted to show you, I didn't show you any of those, like those smaller eggs where you could see them self-standing. I was only showing you larger pieces that then had, you know, stands I was using, you know, to show them. So. So do, do you want to, do you want to mention quickly uh, about your, um, the classes that you give or anything like that or? Well, at this point, I've not been holding any classes, okay. for, you know, offhand. All I could say is, you know, if you haven't already, if you would just share my website with folks. And again, this idea, if you wanted to have a demo, maybe like, you know, even maybe next spring, you know, because again, eggs in spring are the, you know, is that time of the year, you know, we can, you know, come out and do a hands-on demo if we're wanting to go that, you know, depending obviously on the whole pandemic. <laughs> ends up in the next few months and we're you know what we're able to do so that's just another option of you know what one can do you know we can do this so yeah but i'm not i'm it generally it's interesting i'm it the problem for me right now is that i don't have the space in which to hold the classes unfortunately because in my studio floor we're actually not allowed to use candles outdoors it, yeah, but, well, but then you have issues around wind, candle, wind, you know what I mean? You know, unless, for instance, we have a class where everybody, you know, there are electric styluses that are available that one can get. There are these Ukrainian gift shops where you can get the, an electric version of that stylus. So the heater is in the, in the stylus. I actually don't like working with it. I find that the wire and the plastic handle that one has to have around the metal heating element within the unit is just heavy to me like in, in my hand mm -hmm. yeah exactly so i just prefer the traditional tool because it is so light you know it's just you know it's a wooden stick and a little piece of brass so you know you hardly feel it so I, that's mm -hmm. why i don't use it i have one but i never use it so in any event that's you know some of these were particulars Thank you so much, Paul. It's been such fun. And well, you really opened our eyes to Pasanki Plus. Maybe that's what we call it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I think and you called it, now let me see. You called it magic, making magic with eggs. So yes. You, it, yes. You do. Yes. So well, thank, thank you. Again. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you again for having me. Maybe it was very interesting. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna Good leave job. your I'll, I'll leave your administrative side of the meeting now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Have a lot. Great rest of you. Thank you. All right, bye bye. 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 I can show you a few pictures from the workshop that he did. I'm not sure how much you can see. These were the three two the three items that I uh, that we had was a little tea light, a little bee, cube of beeswax and the tool. And then these were some of his eggs. With intricate design. And these were ones that were, you know, not traditional ones. And some on the goose eggs and other ones. The face. Oh, that's great. These were all pieces that he brought to the workshop that we saw. But let, me, let me see if I can get out of there. Okay. Uh, and he had some to show the different motifs. And then here's the egg that I was working on. So I think maybe this would explain it a little bit better. We had a white egg and I put some wax on it and then I dipped it in yellow. So there's an they, the wax dripped all over as me trying to control the tool. This was the, the dye that he used, came in packets, and then he had uh, plastic containers set up with the dye. So we took turns uh, 
that was when it got dyed blue. And not all the pictures came out. There was some red dye as well. So I'm trying to use some of his traditional designs and sectioning it off, as you saw in his first, uh, his first slides. And then this was my egg when it mm. was finished. So what the first piece of the first wax done on the white, it, now the white shows. Then there was ye yellow, then there was red. So you can see the little red hearts. Mm -hmm. And I think that was it. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, I broke my egg, but ah. uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I should have saved it and made it into a mosaic. But yeah. it was kind of, you know, <laughs> and it, the inside was kind of gross at that point. So I said, okay, bye-bye, that's it. I have a picture. But you know, let us know if you think you might be interested in a workshop. It, it was really fun. You know, there's a learning curve to, to controlling the tool. And you know, we did it once. Uh, it was a short workshop because he was give, also giving a lecture. But since he's already done the lecture, if he came to do a workshop, it would be just doing it. So you know, we have a little more time to practice. <laughs>